to die on the cross for our sins, and that you rising from the grave, the Lord, gives us victory over uh, this life. It's your victory. It's your righteousness. It's who you are. Nothing that we have done, but everything that you have already done. We love you, Lord, and we just want to offer these uh, songs of praise to you because you deserve it, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody stay together. Amen. All right, I want you guys to stand and let's worship together.
Um, Leah, today, uh, this week, this Thursday is MOPS, correct? So this Thursday is MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers, and it takes place here at New Day, and it is 10 or 10.30? 10.30. 10.30. Um, and I don't know much about MOPS because I don't have preschoolers. My kids are all adults. Is there anything else I need to add to MOPS? Okay. Sorry, I wasn't prepared. Um, and nursery is available for that. Um, also, we have put out clipboards with the sign-up sheets for our Thanksgiving feast. We do a lunch here, a follow-up lunch, um, normally the last Sunday of every month. Um, December will be different, but... Uh, so there are clipboards on most of the rows that if you'd like to sign up, that way we make sure that we have enough of uh, the meat, vegetables, desserts, and not all of one thing. So sign up for that. We also have um, invitations out on the chairs for our annual New Day Ladies Brunch and Ornament Exchange. And that takes place at my house in Holiday Island, 55 Lakeside Drive. And that's from 10 to noon on December the 11th. It's a Saturday. And we bring a wrapped ornament. We don't put our names on it or any kind of tag because we put them all under the tree and then we take numbers and we play Dirty Santa, which is a lot of fun. Okay. And um, community prayer is this Thursday and that is taking place. We don't know. We, we don't know. Okay. So that's hosted by various churches in our community, and apparently we don't know which church is hosting. It's <laughs> okay. Okay. It is this week. That's from your wife. Oh, the thanks don't have it for now because because of the community Thanksgiving, and that is a value. That is a value. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, see, we're all wheels off the bus without a wife. No. Exactly. She knows everything that's going on. Um, I never listen to something. Oh, um, also, Eureka Springs is having their Christmas parade this year, and Danielle would like very, very much for somebody to take the lead on um, putting together our float. That doesn't mean you're in charge of all of it. We will have people that come and help. But as we know, Danielle has way too many hats on, and we need somebody to take charge of that. So please, if you feel led to do that, let Danielle call me, Roger, somebody know, and we will recruit lots of helpers to help you with that project. And I think the parade is December 3rd. Okay. Also, um, we have arranged two ladies' crafting nights. One will happen tomorrow night. And at Craftsy Chicks from 5.30 to 8.30, that group is full. We still have at least one slot open for the next Monday, December 6th, 5.30 to 8.30. We generally will meet either in Holiday Island or here to carpool so we don't all have to drive over there. It's on Highway 62 between Green Forest and Alpena. So let me know if you'd like to take part in that. Okay, am I forgetting anything, Paul? You're asking the wrong guy. I gave it to you. Turn around. Yes, what do we got? The ladies and the men's light groups. Yes. So yeah, Tuesday night. Every Tuesday night. Ladies are at 6 30, men are at 7. So the men are downstairs down here, and the ladies are in the upper room. And I, I think that's everything. All right. Yes. Nursery schedule is posted in front of the nursery door. Okay, so the nursery schedule is posted in front of the door. For yes. those that have signed up to be workers in the nursery. Me and Kyla are in the nursery today. And Kyla and Miss Jordan are in the nursery today. And I'm taking Danielle's place in the upper room. All right, kiddos, for the happy room, go with Miss Rhonda. Yes. And bigger kids that are going out to Children's Church, go with Miss Leah and Mr. Derek. I've got their hands up back there. Thank you. Thank you, Davina. Well, it's great to be with you. It's great to see you. And uh, it is a very beautiful morning uh, here in the Ozarks. I love, I love the sunshine, and it always kind of helps. I mean, when it's raining, it's, I get it. It's tough to get out of bed, right? I mean, I, I know I can get a couple of witnesses on that. So, yeah. Well, um, all right. So instead of.
telling you, well, there is one thing I'll tell you. So, all right, so November has become, I don't know when this started, but just a few years ago, November was this no-shave November. And so you see a few more burly men around, evidently for awareness for men's health. But I was already on this, like, I was like, man, I just want to grow out my beard again. I haven't in six or seven years. But here's what happened. When it started coming in, I was like, who's that guy? I've seen a lot more gray in this thing. I'm like, what is going on? This was six years ago. That can't be like, and you turn 50 and you like gray up. You got hair coming out of places you don't want it coming out of. I'm like, it's great. I need just a, you know, chainsaw and a, <laughs> get everything and take it care Anyway, yeah, sorry. Well, I, I wanted to do some memes today. I came across some funny ones again. Now, I mean, this is this is just keep it lighthearted. There might be a twinge of political stuff in here, but don't get your ruffle. But, you know, feathers in a ruffle. Okay, yeah, just just these are just kind of funny. Okay, first one is breaking news: the federal government now recommends you wear a blindfold along with your face mask to protect you from seeing what's really going on. Okay, <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Okay, next one. Moving on, right? Take me somewhere expensive. <laughs> the gas station, yes. Dinner and a candlelight at a gas station, for sure. All right, and this is the world leaders have just met for climate change. This is them returning from home. <laughs> I mean, come on now. Let's get real. And the last one is Black Friday's going to look a little different. <laughs> and, um, shipping containers with everybody swimming toward the shipping container, yes. Yes, uh, I just thought those were great today. <laughs> uh, yeah, they needed some of that, yeah. Yeah, we've got to laugh or you, you might just, you know, swing something. All right, yeah. So, all right. Well, it is it is it is a, a different Sunday today for for many reasons, but uh, yeah, we'll get into some of this. Um, now, when we do something that we shouldn't do, for many, the flesh reaction is to justify what's been done, right? I mean... And then maybe if pressed, then there might be a little more ownership of the offense, okay? And self-preservation is kind of a common flesh response. You know, no one in our flesh wants to ever admit of wrongdoing. I, I mean, I was waiting kind of for an amen. On Sunday. I, mean, I mean, let's be real, right? Yeah. But God and his kingdom operate differently, right? So, in fact, he says if we try to save our lives in pride, we will actually lose it. But if we die to our lives through surrender, our lives will be saved through humility, forgiveness, redemption, and restoration by the blood of Jesus, right? He has told us humility, confession, and loving submission to one another is all a part of God's truth that sets us free. It brings reconciliation, it brings restoration, and it brings true freedom. If we will do it his way, then the fruit of his kingdom principle is freedom. His kingdom principles never fail. We must know and apply the truth and it will set us free. The Bible says, for a lack of knowledge, people perish. This is not knowledge of the world. It's knowledge of his kingdom principles and how they work. It's how they work. And if we will obediently operate in these principles through faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, it's not our power, it's his working in us and through us, then we will be free. His kingdom principles never fail. They work 100% of the time because he is faithful, he's never lied, and he never will. Okay? This world and its principles will lead us astray every single time, always. The enemy tries to convince us that God is somehow holding out on us or wronging us in some way. That's not any new tactic. I mean, we saw that in the Garden of Eden. Correct? With Eve, he tried to convince Eve that she didn't have something that she already had. The enemy 
enemy's calling card is always doubt and fear. Okay? So if any of you have ever experienced doubt and fear, today you are not alone and you're in good company. All right? One of the most prominent figures of the Old Testament struggled with these as well. His name was Moses. Okay? You might recall Moses doing a couple of great things for God. Just a couple. Right? <laughs> I mean, he's, there's a significant portion of the Old Testament talking about Moses. All right, so today's sermon title is, What Would You Do for His Glory? What would you do for His glory? And there's a lot to unpack there, and this may take me a couple weeks to do this. But I'm going to do something a little different today than I have. Um, I've spent the week kind of reading through the life of Moses, and it covers the span of uh, technically four books if you count Leviticus, but it's Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Leviticus is more of the Levitical law, but the number, you know, the uh, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy really talk about Moses' life. So um, we're going to take kind of a crop duster view of Moses. Okay. Now, what I mean by crop duster is like we're going to fly higher and more general with some info, and then dive into places that uh, we can you know, get to drop some dust and unpack what's there, okay? And then we'll move back up to a higher view of his life and move through some of those chapters. But, and, you know, again, this may be a two-part series. I don't know. We'll see what, you know, it definitely won't get in everything covered for sure. But uh, I just want to kind of get us started in this direction today. Um, he's one of the most significant figures of the Old Testament. So it's good to know who he is. And how we today can relate to him. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we'll, we may take a couple of weeks. And, you know, I just I just believe so strongly that there are some very relatable things that we can learn from Moses' life uh, today. So, so let's start with his name, all right? His name, Moses, in Hebrew, Moshe, okay? It means drawn. And it was named that because there was a... I drew him out of the water. That was the quote. Um, his background as a Hebrew baby, um, you know, Moses, by the order of Pharaoh, was going to be killed because he was a firstborn. Pharaoh had ordered the killing of all the firstborn Hebrew children, uh, men, you know, sons. So Moses' mother put him in a basket in the Nile River to protect him. And then Pharaoh's daughter actually found him. And see, this is just how good God is, right? Even, you know, even he had even Moses' uh, daughter sin for Moses' mother unknowingly to care for him, nurse him. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> and so uh, as Moses grew up, he was a young man, and he was actually, because the Egyptians were oppressing all of the Hebrew uh, people, Moses was just, just had finally gotten fed up with it. You know, and he, he was in a different spot because he grew up under this Egyptian household, but he was seeing what was happening to his people. And he just finally had enough, and he went and beat an Egyptian, killed him for beating up the Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew. Well, there were a couple guys that saw him uh, do this, and it got back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh came after him, and Moses fled to uh, Midian. So as he fled to Midian, uh, he ended up in Exodus 2. If you wanted to start in Exodus 2, you can kind of follow along a little bit, you know, as we'll go through several chapters, but from a high level. So that's kind of, if you want to follow along that way, you can so when Moses got to Midian, uh, he noticed there were uh, seven priests' daughters, and they were at, trying to get water for their uh, flock, and they got driven off by some shepherds. And so Moses actually rescued their flock and watered the flock uh, for them. And so it gained favor with him and this priest, and he ended up marrying uh, a woman named Zipporah, lovingly known as Zippy. I'm just kidding. No, that's not true. It's one of those things. You don't find that on biblicalnames.com to name your kid. All right. 
I mean, Zipporah doesn't make the list usually. I haven't heard that one. You know. Yeah, anyway, yes, <laughs> moving on, sorry. I might just the way my brain works sometimes. I'm sorry, yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> so while Moses is tending to the father-in-law's flock at Mount Horeb, which is a significant place, an angel appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Now, we know that many of us who, who have been around church and heard Bible stories, you've heard about the burning bush, right? So that's a very popular bush. So in this burning bush, the angel is calling and telling Moses, God wants you to deliver the Hebrew people from Pharaoh's oppression. So then in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 2, or chapter, I think chapter 3 now, the angel said to him, God's heard them crying. And then in verse 9 it says, And the Lord said, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. That's interesting to me, the wording of that. You know, there are cries that we have that may qualify more as complaint, right? And then there are, you know, there, there are complaint or, or inconvenience. Then there are cries of desperation of daddy God to come to the rescue, right? Those are ones he hears, you know? And he knows the difference. Why? Because, it, I mean, he's, he's our daddy God. As a, as a father, I knew when Alyssa and Caleb, Dax and Bailey, I knew their different cries. You know, we, Danielle and I, we were like, we would listen to the cry, we're like, no, they just kind of, they're just angry that they're in bed right now. You know, or, or like, uh, no, that's a hurt cry. You know, right? <laughs> their hand got stuck between the rail. Okay, yes, no, we know that cry, right? So, Daddy God knows the difference in our cries. Probably even better than we do, right? So, Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, and we'll look at 11 and 13, <laughs> that God said, I will certainly be with you. Now, that should be enough said, right? Really. If God says, I am, will certainly be with you, we kind of look at Moses and like, man, what's, what's up, dude? He said he's going to be with you. But Moses is in the middle of it, right? And he starts making excuses, right? Now, this is where this gets familiar, right, <laughs> to many of us. God told Moses he was going to use signs and wonders to prove to the Israelites that Moses had been with God to cause the people to respond. That sounds awfully familiar. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the disciples did? Isn't that the modeling for us that God will show up to show himself so that people can have faith to believe? And man, this really starts hitting close to home, especially the excuses, right? I mean, you know, why can't God use us? You know, we, we start making excuses why? Well, you know, I don't want to do that, you know, or what are they going to think? So we, in Exodus 4, you know, after Moses is kind of like, why me, Lord? We get into this, Moses is now still having trouble buying in himself at this, at this point. Now, we look at it and go, okay, Moses, uh, there's a talking burning bush. What's the problem here, right now? <laughs> we can't see it from that. But many of us, you know, God has proved himself over and over to us. And yet we still question what he can do through us. So this was not just affirmation to Moses that God was speaking. It's also a test of faith for Moses to trust God in his instruction. God used similar wonders to even grow Moses' faith. So what did he do? In Exodus chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, the staff was turned to a snake. That's not the faith part. <laughs> the, next, the rest of the story is, it. so Moses has the staff, he lays it on the ground, it becomes a snake. That's pretty wild. The faith comes in when God said, okay, pick up the snake, and it will turn back to a staff. 
You're like, uh, let's think this through, God. Right? It was after Moses reached out to pick up the snake that it turned back to a staff. Then verses 6 and 7, another sign he used, he said, he had put, and Moses put his hand in his cloak, pulled it out, and it was all leprosy ridden. And then he put it back in and brought it back out, and it was healed. It was restored. And then there, if that wasn't enough, there were some contingency signs. God said, well, if they don't believe you after that, try this. Take a cup of cup of your hands, pull some water out of the Nile River, and drop it on the ground, and it will be blood. It will turn to blood on the ground. Okay, that's cool, God. And Moses then, in verses 10 through 13, goes back to excuses, okay? All right, so let's start there, verse 10 of Exodus chapter 4. Moses said to the Lord, and I, I just think this is so funny. I, I find funny things in probably wrong places, but I mean, this is funny to me. All right, Moses said to the Lord, uh, pardon me, your servant, Lord. Uh, pardon your servant, Lord. I have been, I've never been eloquent neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant i am slow of speech and tongue and the lord's response is um who gave human beings their mouths who makes them deaf or mute who makes them sight or makes them blind who gives them sight or makes them blind is it not i the lord that's funny to me right okay <laughs> yeah he said now go i will help you speak and will teach you what to say but Moses said, uh, pardon your servant, Lord. Uh, please send someone else. Right? You know, and the Lord's anger burned against Moses. All right, you, you've even ticked off the Lord here. All right, it's time to back off of this, right? Said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levi? I know he can speak well. And, you know, God was like, fine, okay, here, let Aaron speak. This just cracks me up, you know? I mean, you know, Moses' flat-out response was, uh, please send someone else, you know. And, I mean, how many of us can relate to that, right? He's asking us to do something that might be a little out there. And we say, um, Lord, yeah, surely you don't mean me, right? I've had a couple of those moments in my life, for sure. And, you know, as a side note here, I found it very interesting uh, back up in uh, verse 11, you know, he's he's saying, the, who makes them deaf or mute? Who makes them, who gives them sight or makes them blind? That's interesting to me because sometimes we kind of, uh, we kind of have this view of God that somehow through his sovereignty, he can't work stuff out. Even in the natural, we might see somebody deaf, mute, or blind. And I'm all in, all in faith to pray for them. Absolutely. But one of the things that came to mind was um, it's possible that God, that sovereign God may be working in a way that we are not seeing in the natural. I think of the evangelist Nick Wojcik. He's, a, he's an evangelist with, with no arms and no legs. And he travels the world speaking. Talk about challenge, right? I mean, what what what's God doing in that? Why ain't he grown out his legs and his arms? Well, because he's reaching all kinds of people for the kingdom, right? Even in the midst of. So sometimes, sometimes God's goodness looks a little different in the natural. And I mean, who knows? I mean, this is completely kind of hypothetical, but, you know, maybe maybe someone who remains deaf is, is hearing something they would, it's keeping them from hearing something that they would own that could change their spiritual destiny if their physical nature had not caught up yet. Or maybe somebody mute is protecting them from speaking death over themselves or someone else. Blindness protecting them from seeing something so egregious or traumatic that it changes their spiritual destiny. Amen. God is sovereign. Okay? I mean, even COVID, right, let's, let's, even COVID, you know, there could be 
some that actually have gotten it that will allow them to be to have their immunity be so strong that they can withstand exposure from variants. Sovereign God can do that. Right? So the enemy can try to take us out in so many different ways, but God is still good, he's still sovereign, and he works all things out for his good. God can allow the trial in our life to strengthen us for that next chapter. And he may, he may be equipping us that actually brings a safety to us going through whatever the next season. So now, let's return back to Moses. Chapter 5 of Exodus. He returns to Egypt. He's prepared spiritually to return equipped to obey the Lord's commands, right? So Exodus 5 is where Moses and Aaron, they visit Pharaoh for the first time, asking him to free the Israelites. All right, they're going in, they're doing it. And then Pharaoh said, well, because you ask, I'm going to make it harder on everybody else. And they were like, okay, this took a turn. We didn't think it was going to work out this way, right? Made it harder on the Israelites. Therefore, this caused doubt and question for Moses and Aaron, and it caused grumbling from the Israelites towards Moses and Aaron. But Moses and Aaron had to hold on to the promise of God. God also reminded Moses in Exodus 6, verse 2, I am the Lord. Sometimes we need to remember he is the Lord. You're not going to get every answer. And the Israelites obviously didn't get this. Um, and in verse, uh, verse 9 of chapter 6, they just saw their discouragement, the harsh labor, the inconvenience, the toil, right? Then, then come the excuses again. Moses <laughs> said, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Because I stutter. This was part of Moses' issue. That's why he was slow to speech. Slow to speak. Well, God told Moses he was making him like God to Pharaoh. And Aaron was like a prophet. So whatever Moses would tell Aaron, Aaron would tell Pharaoh. And God would use them. And he would allow Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. Now, that's a, that's a tough concept for people sometimes. Why would God do that? Well, we first have to understand what's happening when this happens. You know, if the Spirit is the one who draws us to Him, then we have an opportunity to make that choice in faith. We have that opportunity. The drawing is Him, right? So if, if God, if we have said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not doing this. I don't want God. Then God will withhold that drawing. It's called a debased mind. Romans chapter 1. Okay? So this concept is, is very similar. He actually allowed Pharaoh to harden his heart. And because God stopped drawing him into that place of being able to see. Why did he do that? Well, we will see later that it was to show that God is God. Now, very interestingly, after this point, then you have the plagues, all right? Exodus chapter 7 through 11 are all about the plagues. You know, God initiated a series of plagues, each one Pharaoh refusing to let the Israelites go. And, you know, the first three, the magicians and uh, I guess what they called the secret arts people, they were able to emulate what, what, what Moses and Aaron were doing through the power of God. Kind of like, so what? You know, isn't that what the enemy likes to do? Create the counterfeit and go, what, what do you got? When, and it presses us to keep believing, right? We got to keep faith in standing in those moments. So the magicians copied every single wonder and played through the snake, 
the Nile to the blood and frogs. And the gnats, they couldn't do. Okay? I'm like, who knew the gnats would be so important in life, right? Like, yeah, oh, many summers in Texas. I'm just, okay. They had a purpose. Okay. Thank you, Lord. All right. So, so then the plagues continued with flies. And amidst the plague, this is interesting here. Amidst the plague, God dealt differently and saved his people from the plague. The plagues did not touch the Israelites. That's an interesting concept. And I know we've got, I, I did a series on Revelation. And I, I've shared my thoughts about how I think we'll be here a little longer than everyone thinks. Because of this concept that is so consistent in Scripture. He doesn't promise that he will take us out of or away from the, the judgment or the problem or the, he, he, he actually shows up in the midst of and protects us. So if he's consistently doing that through scripture, then to, to feel like we've just got to, man, I don't care what's going to happen from here. You know, we're out of here. You know, I, I, I don't see that in scripture. Very consistently. So we have to be ready to stand in faith. To believe that moments like this, that even with all the chaos that is happening around us, God will be there for us. Okay? Let's go to Exodus chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. He doesn't take us out of the judgment. He is with us in the midst and saves us from the judgment touching us. I mean, Daniel in the lion's den. He went in the den, folks. He was in the den. And the lion did not touch him and, and harm him in any way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. They went in the furnace. I'm sure when they were getting ready to get tossed in, they were like, where are you, God? Right? And he, they get down and they're like, what's up, boys? I'm here. <laughs> it's okay. Right? It's going to be okay. So then there were more plagues. Pharaoh hardens his heart. The livestock were corrupted. Horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, goats. And no livestock of the Israeli people were touched. Boils, then hail. Moses gave Pharaoh a heads up on the hail. Which I thought was very graceful for you. Yeah. He said, hey, go pull your livestock because we're about to the hail happen. You know, you kill everything. Exodus 9, 34 and 35. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. Now it's not just him hardening his heart. It says he and, and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not let the Israelites go just as the Lord had said through Moses. Again, not a surprise to God. We, there is an allowance, an opportunity, a window, if you will, to choose to have faith or not. God draws us, but we choose. He gives us a window until it's pretty certain that we've made our choice. And Exodus 10, 1 and 2 tells why God hardened their hearts. It was a testimony. It was a testimony. Because he wants others to know you have a choice and I'm giving you a window. But if you don't choose me, there are some dire consequences. And it's a kingdom thing. Some of us want God to take away different stuff in our life that's inconvenient because, man, you know, why did he let that happen? Well, if he intervenes in this, then he has to intervene in all of this. And he no longer becomes a God that we choose to love. He becomes a dictator that we have to love. 
And that's not love. Okay. Then more plagues, right? Locusts, darkness, and then the firstborn. Moses had enough credibility by this point that men and women just started giving the Israelites a plunder of silver and gold and clothing, which God told them would happen, which is kind of cool. So by midnight, then uh, when midnight came, every firstborn son of the Egyptians died from Pharaoh all the way to the last female slave, as well as firstborn cattle. And again, the Israelites were saved from this judgment. It's interesting to me. You, you might say, wow, firstborn, that's pretty savage, God. Well, guess what this all started with, with Moses? Pharaoh killing the firstborn of his people. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay? God will not be mocked. So all of this happened overnight. In Exodus uh, chapter 11, verses 7, it said, not even a dog will bark. There will not be even a ruckus of any sort. It will just happen. And this is how Passover was established. To remember how God delivered them in Exodus chapter 12. So what's Passover? Well, Passover was a time where they would stick the blood of a, a lamb over the doorposts. And this allowed them during this time when this, the firstborn were going to be slain if the death angel saw the blood over the door, he passed over them. There's all kinds of great figure, you know, uh, illustration about that. We can see the correlation between the blood of the lamb and the blood of Jesus. And that's, again, you know, this is where I see another reference to like tribulation times. You get the seal of God on our forehead. The mark is, the, is Satan's counterfeit. But the seal of God is placed on our forehead by an angel. I read it in Revelation. That's the identification point, and we will be passed over. It's my two cents about that. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Exodus. Uh, let's go to 13. So God led them out of Egypt the long way to avoid Philistine country. Okay. So after Pharaoh finally gave up and said, all right, enough, you guys get out of here. All right, they took everybody and went and they, they hit the trail. Well, the shortest distance would have been to go through Philistine country. But because they didn't, Pharaoh kind of saw that as an opportunity. Okay? Now, while, while the Israelites were being guided by this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in Exodus 13, 21, it was leading them up to... The Red Sea. Well, Pharaoh then sees that, why are the Israelites? It looks like they don't know where they're going. And so Pharaoh came after the Israelites one last time to try to pin them up against the Red Sea. Exodus 14. Again, another little humorous spot for me. I find these humorous places that might be not, you know, I don't know if they're appropriate or not, but it's just funny to me. All right, so as 14, verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked, Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after him, them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, and I'm going to be a little melodramatic here, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert, right? I mean, how crazy is that, right? We are reading it and going, what are you guys thinking, right? They start freaking out and forgetting what God had already done. 
And now, another little humorous caveat to me was in verse 15. God said to Moses, why are you crying to me? <laughs> I'm like, what? You're going, God, that's your answer to me right now? What? Why are you crying to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I was like, wow. You know, I was reading through it. I was like, man, that's really kind of wild. <laughs> What it said to me was, God had already empowered Moses to be the leader. And the leader was accountable for the Israelites. Oh, I'm feeling that as a leader of this house, one of the leaders of this house. I'm feeling that. Not calling you Israelites. Don't take a picture. Yeah. It was just the brevity, the heaviness. The accountability, the mantle. We all want to lead something. Maybe not. So during this time, they're pinned up against the Red Sea. The pillar of cloud repositioned between them and the Egyptian army. And in verse 21 and 22, so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with strong wind. That wasn't just to snap your fingers and, you know, it's not Charlton Heston, okay? All right, you know, he was like, oh, you know, I mean, in like uh, 30 seconds. It just didn't happen that way, Johnny, right? It was just, just uh, it was an all night thing. I mean, it took some perseverance. And faith to believe. So the waters divided and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Verses 25 through 27. The Egyptians pursued after them and the walls of water collapsed around them. Not one survived. Okay. God and Moses at that point had earned finally the trust of the Israelites. Finally, they earned the trust for a moment, <laughs> right? So let's go to, uh, I guess, after in verse in chapter 15, you know, they're in <laughs> the beginning of chapter 15, they're three days into the journey, you know? They, they, there was water that was corrupted. It, was, it wasn't good drinking water. So they've gone three days without water. So, I mean, but they started grumbling, right? Interesting that it was water that was the issue, and God just showed them, I can part a Red Sea for you, and then they start grumbling about the water. And Moses has just got to be thinking, man, everybody's got an opinion around here. You know, <laughs> like what? Trying to lead this group of people. So verse uh, chapter 15, verse 25, 26. Then Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Okay, that's the best water filtering service ever, right? I mean, come on, right? So there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, keep all his decrees. I will not bring on any of you or bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now he's testing their faith again. Verse in, in Exodus 16, the Israelites start grumbling and they get a little hangry, right? I <laughs> call it hangry, right? against Moses and Aaron. And in verse 3, you know, if we'd only died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. I mean, they they, they had this persona of, or this remembrance in their head. You know, Remember how good it was? You know, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? They're all complaining about we're going to die. And they go, man, we had it so good, right? I mean, it's nonsense, right? And so they get led into the desert and they have to rely on the Lord for daily provision. And so he provides manna and quail. And he tells them, 
Again, more of a faith journey. So you only need manna for the day. You, can't, you don't need to be collecting anymore. If they collected more, turn to maggots. Which, that may help some of you that are hungry right now. Okay. All right. So telling the Israelites to trust the Lord and obey instruction. That was their faith, faith journey. And so now Moses, as any good leader would do, he starts deflecting their grumbling. <laughs> he says, and, and being, you know, is not something in verse, let's go to Exodus uh, 16, verse 7. It says, who are we that you would grumble against us? <laughs> I mean, you don't have a problem with us. You got a problem with God. <laughs> I mean, so manna was provided for them daily. And then you got a little extra on the sixth day so that they didn't have to go looking for it on Saturday. So, of course, there were some that did not listen to the instruction. Again, it was interesting. Exodus 16, 28, God addressed Moses. He holds leadership accountable. So now let's go to Exodus 17. Again, there was grumbling by the Israelites. And Moses was grumbling to God about the Israelites. Right? There's drama for both. God tells Moses to strike the rock at Horeb, Mount Horeb. And, it, and, it, and water came. So now they go on this journey of the Amalekites are defeated because Aaron and Hur held up Moses' arms during the battle. If they let his arms down, they'd start losing. So they had to hold his arms up, all right? Some of you may be familiar with that story. In Exodus 18, they started choosing judges. And that's where the concept of elders and governing church structure comes from, where the smaller group governs the larger group, okay? Because well, there was no way that Moses, and even Moses and Aaron could do that all by themselves. In fact, Moses father-in-law came and said, hey, you can't do this. You're going to wear yourself up. You need to share the load. Exodus 20 through 24, this is the Ten Commandments, and they begin to establish governing laws and created the covenant between God and his people. All right? Exodus 25 through 28 outlines the covenant specifications. Like for the ark, the table, the lamps, the tabernacle, the altar, courtyard, oil. The ark of the covenant housed the tablets of the covenant law. And then God's instruction came through uh, this ark and the promise of the covenant. Okay. Then uh, Exodus 29 was consecration or a setting apart of the priests. Um, there, were, there were certain things that they had to do. And again, all of this is, is God giving instruction. When we read this stuff, we, we kind of kind of we might blip out because we think, okay, yeah, I don't have to do that today. But the concept is still true. You know, I may not have to, you know, spread blood all over my cloak or whatever. Uh, you know, I may not have to make animal sacrifices anymore, but there's a consecration of walking holy with the Lord. Okay, be set apart. If we're going to leave. In any capacity in ministry. And we are all called to be ministers of the gospel. So he's calling us all up into this. So Exodus 31, it talks about the Sabbath instruction. And I want to point out here, verses 12 and 13 of Exodus 31 and verses 16 and 17. The quote is there, it's to the Israelites. It's to the Israelites. The observance of Sabbath as a day was specific to the Israelites under this covenant. Even says, it will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Okay? When Jesus came, it's even referenced in the New Testament, there was a new covenant. There's a new covenant. And it was established for Gentiles that would ultimately, and ultimately, listen to this. This is important to know. We read in Revelation what happens. How, do, how does Israel come to know Jesus as the Messiah? Because the Gentiles are spurring them to jealousy. Because the movement of God that is happening in the Gentiles. 
So I, I, I tell you this right now, that he's trying to tell them there's a new covenant. And it's built around love. Love of me and love of your name. Exodus 32, golden calf. We probably have heard about this one quite a bit. Let's start at verse 1 of 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. In Carroll County terms, hey, we don't even know if he's still alive yet. <laughs> right? They, they're like, man, he's been gone for 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. The Israelites grew restless and they began to doubt. And poor Aaron, Aaron was the recipient of all the grumbling and Aaron caved. Right? He caved in. So they broke the second commandment, which was making a graven image to God. They made a golden calf. I mean, they did it for God. I mean, let's, they made it an event or a festival to the Lord. Exodus 32, 5 and 6. It says, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. We have good intentions. But if we're just caving, instead of doing what the Lord told us to, we're not any different than anybody else committing idolatry. So what are we bowing to? Are we bowing to religion? Or are we bowing to the word of the Lord and listening to his voice of instruction? Verse 6. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Basically, got up early and partied, right? They were in it for the long haul. It was all day, all right? I mean, isn't that just like modern Western church? Hmm. We see God move, then he tells us to wait, and he waits, and then we question and we get impatient. And so we want to take the bull by the horns and just make it happen oh, for God. Right? Verse 7. God says, back down. God says, get back down there. <laughs> I love this. Again, a humorous part. Because your people that you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. Yeah, I mean... I mean, we've done that at my house. I mean, I, the kids will do something. Danielle, while I watch so your kids. Bye, bye, bye. You know, I mean, I mean, God's doing a little bit of this. I think this is so funny, right? Hey, your people down there, you know. It's like, what? Yeah. Verse 32, 8 through 10. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Verse 9. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. That's God throwing some shade right there. All right, okay. That means hard-headed, all right? I've seen these people. They are hard-headed. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I might destroy them. And then I make you into a great, I will make you into a great nation. That's kind of a hilariously relatable exchange, right? I mean, between Moses and God, the Lord is just straight up mad at these folks. Verse 11 through 14 sounds kind of like Moses talking to the Lord you know, talking the Lord down from, you know, bringing the hellfire brimstone, you know what I mean? You know, that like, like Moses going, okay, God, yeah. Uh, then Moses um, comes down, then he sees what's going on, and then madly throws down the Ten Commandments, the tablets, and breaks them into a million pieces. 
Verse 19 is where he did. And he, I mean, and no doubt, he walked in, he's like, Aaron, where are you at? I mean, Aaron blew it. He blew it as lead. Absolutely. And Moses asked, finally, you know, after all of the commotion, Moses finally asked, he asked everybody, hey, who is with me? Who's going to follow me? He said, if you're going to follow me, come over here. If you're not going to follow me, stay over there. Well, some did stay over there. And verse 27 and 28 said that they were instructed to kill 3,000 people. We don't like to think of the justice of God. But there is a point that we, that he gives us a lot of grace, a lot of grace, and then our window is closed. When he comes back, that's the ultimate end. That's when it's over. Up until that, anybody's got a shout, okay? Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just saying, if, if somebody stiff arms God and says, I'm gonna do it my way, it's going to be really hard for them to come back to that place and go, okay, I believe, without something very dramatic going on in their life. So this moment right here was yet another layer of sifting of those that sin that may have chosen Moses, maybe even afterwards, you know, Verse 35 said, the Lord struck those folks with a plague as punishment. So they might have gotten scared and kind of gone, okay, I don't know where we're with Moses. But maybe they really didn't believe. Maybe they were just kind of faking it. God added another layer of faith to sift them out. Because he wanted to know who was with him. Exodus 33, 1 through 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked or hard-headed people and I might destroy you on the way. <laughs> Again, a little funny little caveat to me, right? I mean, like, God said, you know, I'm not even going to go with you because of a dude. I mean, it sounds like a parrot, man. I'm like, you go do it because if I stay around, I'm going to kill you, you know, right? It's like, you know, just get out of me, you know. I feel like there's some of that going on right here. God's going to let them toil a little bit without him as punishment for not obeying. Anybody else feel like you've been disciplined like that before? <laughs> God, you're kind of doing your own thing. I, you know, I got this God, you know, and you're like, okay, go ahead. Let's see how that works out. Come get me when you're done. <laughs> Verse four. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. Uh, for the Lord, okay, okay, this is just still too funny to me sometimes. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff necked or hard headed people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. All right, I kind of envisioned with like, you know, dad just coming home and busting up the party. And there's that one guy with the lampshade still on his head. <laughs> okay? I mean, and he goes, if I stay here, I'm going to kill you. Jethro, take off that lampshade, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the vision I had. I'm like, what? It kind of feels like dad just entered the room. And though they thought Moses was mad, I mean, man, they ain't seen nothing yet making God mad, right? Exodus 33, we'll land here for today. Verse 14. He says, God says, 
Finally, he gets to this place and my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses desperately cries out to God and he finally is in that place. He said, God, I don't want to do this without you. We need you. There it is, right? That's the spot. That's the spot. That's the place in our heart that we need to be. I don't want to do this without you, Lord. Verse 18, Moses says, now show me your glory. The Lord agreed to cause all of his goodness to pass in front of Moses. Verses 22 and 23, when God shows up in power, even judgment, he's going to hide us in the cleft of the rock and we will get to see and experience his glory. It won't be a fool, it'd kill us all, right? He gives, he gives us a taste of his glory. And these little things, I mean, we've heard of all kinds of crazy stories. The glory of the Lord showing up. 34 verses 8 and 9. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor, in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked or hard-headed people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Now that's a cry Jesus, God hears, right? That's a cry God hears. Like, okay, now we can do this. And so in that moment, of humility and submission to his will, not our own, it's submission to his will. We are finally open-handed, crying out to the Lord, I don't want to do this without you. Show me your glory, Lord. What is the band? I actually might have Dax come and play just quietly. Spine. We're going to have some, some time of reflection and ministry. If you want to, go ahead and stand. And just... Sometimes we go through the stuff. We talk about the stuff around here. Sometimes we go through it kicking and screaming. But then when we finally get to that place of, it's really surrender, but it comes out like desperation. It's really surrender. We're surrendering to our will and saying, I surrender to yours. Lord. I'm giving up mine. I'm surrendering to you. And sometimes that hits us so deep that it's a desperate place. It's like, Lord, I don't want any more of my own stuff, but this stuff that I'm walking through, I know I'm, I'm walking through it, that you are with me. And I surrender my will. I walk through whatever I got to walk through to experience you. So we finally cry out, all we want is you, Lord. He says a broken and contrite heart, a broken heart and a contrite spirit, he has yet to deny. And that's that place of complete surrender where we come open-handed in trust. We've stopped coming loaded with our own agenda telling God what we're going to do for him or what we want him to do for us. And we just open our hand and we say, I'm done, Lord, you take it. That's where he wants you today. 
So let's pray together. Lord, we just come before you thanking you for the story of Moses. Thank you for his life. Lord, thank you for your word that allows us to learn and grow and see the things that you want us to see for us to surrender, for us to lean into those uncomfortable times that we may not feel like we're equipped, but as our feelings often do, they betray us if they're not wrapped around truth. And the truth is you have equipped us for every good work. You are just waiting for our availability. You're waiting for our surrender. So today, Lord, we want to come before you today and surrender. Lord, I surrender to you my life. If that's you today, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up front and just be available. If that's you today, then your step of faith today is to come forward and let us pray for you today. We want to pray for you. So, Lord God, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to surrender to you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is drawing us right in this moment, even right now. We come right now saying we repent of pride, of believing the lie that we are not equipped to do what you want us to do. We repent of self-hatred. We, we repent of bringing our own agenda to you. And we surrender. I surrender, Lord. I surrender. So, Lord, in this place of surrender today, Lord, I pray for every, every heart represented here today, that you would bring us to that place of complete and total surrender. That we're done doing it our way. Holy Spirit, I would ask that you would come down Fill us with your peace and resolve to stay the course. Stay the course, my friend. Stay the course, my friend. He will show up. Or thank you for these that are coming forward. Thank you for those that may have not yet come forward, but they're in, a, in, a, in this very similar place of surrender. So God, we just ask right now that you would just envelop us with your love and your presence right now. In Jesus' name. We come against the spirit of unbelief. We come against a spirit of pride. We renounce you, spirit of pride. We command you to go in Jesus' name. And we, we ask for total and complete surrender today, Lord. We surrender our heart to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on your cross and made, makes it possible by the blood of your of you shedding your blood on the cross. And us saying yes to you. That we would be passed over from judgment of sin, the consequence of sin, the penalty of sin. So we repent today. 
We ask that you would just come, envelop our hearts. We surrender today. In Jesus' name. Church, just in these moments right here, just if you would, just continue. If you are not necessarily in response to what's happening right now, if you just pray for these that are up front. We'll take just a few more moments. I'm just going to have Dax play. Just prayerfully pray over these folks. Maybe the Holy Spirit's dealing with dealing with you with something that may have not even necessarily been where we landed, but the Holy Spirit's saying something to you, and you need to respond and respond. Respond in obedience. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing in this house. Lord, we thank you for um, the equipping of this house to be whatever you want it to be. Whatever you want us to be in this area and region, we ask that you would just continue to lead us, guide us, and may we just run with passion for you. Help us love you more. Help us love you more. Thank you so much, Lord, for being here today. I pray for every person in this room today that, Lord, you would just help them hear your voice this week and obey. And we will give you all the honor and all the glory. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for uh, just entering in with us. And I appreciate uh, each and every one of you, and I'm grateful that uh, that you've chosen to you know walk with us through a little bit of Moses. We'll continue next week with some more. And uh, thank you guys for being here. You are dismissed.